so uh, thanks, thanks for inviting me. I've uh, really enjoyed the conference so far. So the, I intended to come down here and um, s highlight how much different the front of the brain is from, from V1, but after uh, hearing Dr. DeVries talk yesterday in the poster, I realized maybe it's, it's not so different. Um, you guys have certainly got an impressive way to do things down here and looking at all these properties, but from what I can see, maybe it, it's not too much different, and I'd be interested in from all the V1 experts to, to get your opinion on how things are the same or different. So I'm really interested in, and in my lab studies this area of the brain uh, called medial uh, frontal cortex or the, mainly the anterior cingular cortex. And there's good uh, homology um, across species. Um, so it's this area here, area 24 in the human. Uh, this is the, traditionally called the anterior mid cingulate, which is just regenerated by the corpus callosum. And then uh, you have it in, in primates and then rats. And then in rats, uh, area 24, depending on the atlas, is uh, termed the anterior cingulate cortex. The prelimbic is usually area 32, which also has a homologue here. And here's a, a, a sort of a more uh, of an atlas that we view that we normally use. So we're, area, we're recording in this area 24 here. In, uh, and two cingulate cortex in the rat. And so, again, we study rats. Uh, we hook them up to an amplifier. We record uh, from arrays of drivable tetrodes, a whole bunch of neurons, and get their spike times. And we mainly look, focus on what happens during actions, although we've looked at a massive variety of different tasks, uh, memory tasks, discounting tasks, motivationally driven tasks, whatever sequencing and so on. And, but I'm, what I'm going to talk to you today about is mainly uh, action encoding. Uh, and um, just a really brief introduction to how we do things. So, you know, we, we record multiple cells simultaneously. Let's just take the case of two cells. We have a spike train from these two different cells, and we just bin uh, through time. And then this generates a bin spike count um, matrix for the different neurons. Uh, through time, and we can look at how spike counts change, uh, you know, relative to events. And uh, we look at things in two different ways, mainly, uh, either at single neurons, and this is a way that we recently decided to look at, at things that we find is quite useful, is uh, generally you have some sort of a baseline period and you're looking at some event, and so uh, normative statistics are not really that useful because none of the spike counts are normally distributed. So what we do is we take a, uh, a baseline period, we get the mean, and we generate a theoretical Poisson distribution from that, and then we just say, how many bins are, do we have that are spike counts that are in the 90th percentile of this Poisson distribution that has a mean and variance given from the baseline period, and then we can just march through bin by bin and just say, okay, yes, yes, no, no, whether this is a significant, a bin that is significantly different from, from what you get in the baseline period or not. So we're analyzing trials versus these significant responses. And as we'll see later, this has become incredibly informative for us and for uh, learning about the anterior cingulate. What we also have been doing for a number of years is looking at ensemble activity. And so in the simplest case, where you have an ensemble of two neurons, we're plotting the firing rate of each neuron. And each dot is uh, one time bin. And then so you can look at uh, you know, how these dots cluster in what we call this multiple single unit activity space, or this MSUA space is what we've called it. And we can look at baseline activity or these bins around specific events. and then. Um, Basically, the idea is that in this two-neuron ensemble, um, different events are associated with different patterns in this, of, of activity, and they're different from baseline. And so we've used a variety of different techniques. Mainly, it's looking at the distance between these clusters in a high-dimensional space. And so if you have two neurons, it would be two-dimensional space or 100, 100-dimensional 100 space. We look at the Mahalanobis distance between these clusters, or we do various classification uh, measurements um, both normative, normal, and based on normal distributions, and more frequently things like support vector machine classification of, of event boundaries. And um, we just scale this approach up to as many neurons as we need to, but we do all the analysis in the sort of high dimensional spaces. 
And the bottom line from the ensemble analysis that we've seen over and over again is that uh, if you have just, a, let's say now we move up from two to 10 neurons, these are really multi-purpose neurons and uh, it's really a, a different unique pattern uh, of activity across these neurons uh, as the animal does a lever press or sees an event or gets a reward or does some other action like a wheel turn. And so there's these patterns of activity that we're, we're looking at. So what, we're gonna, what I'm going to focus on today is how um, context uh, affects the activity of these neurons on ensembles. And as it turns out, this is really the main thing, I think. It's, it's taken 20 years of studying these neurons, but it seems to me that's really what is going on in this area of the brain, using contextual information in, a, in different ways. So what I'm going to talk about first is uh, physical context and, and remapping of neuronal activity uh, based on physical context. So this is from a paper we published a few years ago that my uh, postdoc James Hyman did, and I never had any, I, I never thought this would have, do anything, but basically it couldn't be simpler. You just take the animal and you move them between contexts. This is just a different, like, physical context that have different shapes and so on. And this produces these really widespread, it doesn't increase or decrease activity, it just produces widespread changes in the activity patterns. And they emerge as, basically as soon as you put the animal in a different environment. It doesn't matter if you pick them up and place them or we had like gangways connecting contexts. As soon as the animal gets into a new context, there's this shift in the activity state um, of, these, of the ensemble. So this was a 58 neuron ensemble that we reduced to three dimensions for visualization using multidimensional scaling, but the point still remains is that you have these separation in the clusters and these things snap into these new states as they enter new environments. <clears throat> and then so we expanded on this idea and said, okay, let's look just at the simplest situation where they're performing a sequence of actions to get reward in one context and then they do the same thing in another context. And we don't care about them learning the sequence or anything like that. For this talk, we're only interested in the one second or one and a half second period when around each of the, uh, when they're performing each of these actions. And in a single session, they'll either do uh, the same sequence in two different contexts or this, a different sequence in one context, which I'm not going to talk about. But basically, the, we're looking at how an action is encoded. The same action is encoded when it's performed in a different place. And uh, the first thing was that um, if, if, if the animal's just going around this maze and performing each of these actions, so we look at the second around each when they're performing these actions, uh, each dot in, the, in this multiple unit um, activity space is a single lap, and you can see that the dots sort of congregate to different areas of the spaces, which means that there's a different activity pattern that sort of snaps into place whenever they're doing a nose poke, a lever press, or a wheel turn. And as long as they stay within this context, these states are statistically uh, separable. But then what we found is that uh, within the same session when we get, get them to do this and then move into this uh, same task in this other uh, environment, the entire ensemble shifts to a different area of the space. But then if you look within these uh, context clouds of points, you get a reorganization of the three action clusters. And what really was remarkable to me is that there's no change in the overall level of activity and the geometry of these things is basically identical. So the Mahalanobis distance between uh, each action cluster is the same in each context, and each action cluster moves by the same amount. So the whole thing just shifts and then reorganizes in the new context. <clears throat> and so we started to you know, wonder, why, why is this? How does this happen where you get such uniform shifts and reorganizations as they do the same actions in, the, in these different contexts? And so we started looking at single neurons. And uh, <clears throat> I should just say, if anybody's ever not, not familiar with prefrontal, you really can find whatever correlate you want in prefrontal. So they're really, it's not a very informative normally to look at these things, but this will give you a flavor for what's going on. So on top here are rasters when each spike, uh, each line is a spike on a, on a single trial. And so these are three different neurons that it's just picked. So here's a neuron that looks like it has just a for prefrontal, this is amazing. This is a, like a really nicely tuned response. Every time the animal makes a wheel turn, it ramps up and comes down, and seems pretty selective. And then here's a neuron 
and so it does this in both contexts. Here's a neuron that respond, just happens to respond to nose pokes, but it only does it in one context and not the other. Here's a neuron that responds to lever presses, but only in the second context and not the first. And you have every variant of this you can imagine. But just returning to this for a moment, this, the, the, the traditional way of looking at this would be, oh, this is a wheel turn neuron. You know, this, this is what this thing does all its life is encode wheel turns. And if you only did one task in one context, you'd say, yeah, or even in two contexts, you'd say, well, that's what this neuron does. You know, maybe it's some joint angle or something about that. And so, but is this really a wheel turn selective neuron? And what we've come to realize is that this is really the wrong question. It is really not appropriate to classify or categorize neurons in anterior cingulate anyway, as having a specific functional domain. That's not what's going on. Uh, this is now a pie chart not of neurons. I know uh, Dr. Churchland didn't, you know, was making fun of that approach. This is actually trials for this neuron. And these neurons are multiplex like you would believe. And so the WT1 means wheel turns in context one, WT2 wheel turns context two, and so on for the other action. So yes, they have a fairly, they're fairly, 30% of the trials, they respond to wheel turns in both contexts. And that's all you need to get these nice rasters and peri events. But they also respond to lever presses 30% of the time here and 20, you know, 15 here. And sometimes they even respond to nose pokes, but they respond to, oh, geez. Uh, OK. Um, anyway, uh, so you could call this thing, well, it's a 30% wheel turn, 20% lever press context. I mean, it just gets into ridiculousness. Um, it, these neurons don't have static correlates, and uh, you can't really assess what they do in this way. So it's better to categorize trials. And so this is this Poisson approach that I said. Each line here is a trial, and you can look across the, all the neurons at the number of significant trials. And the point is, is that the number across the entire thing is, is the same, the same number of significant trials across this whole ensemble. And if you look at each case, each neuron, and look at whether they gained or lost significant trials for a given action, the, num the amount of loss is almost exactly the same as the gain. The these, these distributions are highly symmetric. So the total number of significant trials is, con is conserved. But if then if you perform PCA on this, or any other technique really, we've done SVM and these other approaches, it's really get these really sharp transitions. And the main, this is PC1. Uh, here of this ensemble, and that is because the number of significant trials kind of shifts from one ensemble of neurons to another. Even though the entire thing stays fixed, the, the, there's a shift in the population of neurons that are responding more to actions. And that's sort of in this pie chart. You have one group that responds more in one context, another group in the other context. You put them together, and it's a highly uniform representation. And this is why everything moved perfectly in the, in the space, and all the distances were preserved. OK, um, so they're really like voters rather than specialists. Okay, I'm going to really have to blow through this quickly. But uh, the other thing is now encoding motivational contexts. Uh, OK, so this is something, this, is, this isn't even a task again. You, they're just, we're just dropping food pellets here and um, then looking at the activity. And this is 28 neurons recorded simultaneously. And uh, the red is the portion where they're just exploring. Green is when the food starts dropping. And then blue is after. And you see this. We've seen this over and over again, this phenomena that you have group, some neurons turn on when the food starts coming. And there's other neurons that just stop firing. And you could take. You know, one of these neurons, flip it upside down, and it would just fit in here. It's kind of like, you know, I often say it's like Tetris. Like the firing rate of the ensemble stays the same. Things are just kind of fitting in like a puzzle, and neurons are turning on and off. And again, the overall level of activity remains constant. And then you can look at a single neuron at, throughout a session, and then at some point they get satiated and they just start to ignore pellets. And you can see that the sort of the overall activity of this neuron just starts decreasing. OK, so then um, we just trained with three tones. One tone is a shock tone that signals a shock's coming, another that a food drop is coming, and another that there's no outcome. And you can run them in different ways. And again, you can find any correlate you would want. These are completely arbitrary examples. This neuron fires to the uh, food tone and to the, drop, the solenoid when they hear the food pellet come. 
doesn't respond here, and responds to the shock. So this, I mean, this neuron does not care about valence. It responds to the food and shock. Here's another neuron that responds just to tones, and it, you know, sort of more to uh, neutral than food, but even more to shock, and just whatever you can imagine. Here's another neuron that now we just normalize the baseline, and we see that it responds to the neutral tone and the neutral outcome. It doesn't even care. I mean, it's opposite valence. And then you know, it responds to the shock tone, but not really the shock, and it doesn't respond at all to the food. And if you normalize to baseline, you'd, you'd think, oh, this responds to neutral events. But in reality, this is what's happening. The whole baseline shifts. And you can see this in the rasters, that uh, to the neutral, the firing is just, or the food, the, it just doesn't fire much on these food trials. So these are like 10 second periods while the, in, in a block of food trials. Here are the trials for a block of shocks, and here for, uh, these, uh, for the neutral outcome. So the baseline shifts, and then basically what you could do uh, is uh, do a, just a simple regression of GLM on kind of the beta values for each of these uh, tone responses during the tone periods, and then a separate one for these block. And what you find is that there's an incredibly strong correlation between the way that they respond to a specific tone and the block response. So the background, it's tracking like this is a bad situation. I'm in a context getting shock, or it's good, I'm getting food. And that's determining, to a large extent, how these neurons are encoding discrete events like, like uh, food or, or uh, I mean, like a tone, different tones. And so you really have to look at the background activity and the state of the animal in order to understand how anterior neurons encode events. And so this is, I'm wrapping it up here. So it's the, 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 these kind of really alter ensemble dynamics and they determine how events are encoded. And it's this sort of thing that's going on. This is the last slide. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, well, Matt, well, you should have told me that 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> OK, this is the last slide anyway. The idea is that, is that you really, the anterior cingulate has really general purpose neurons. Uh, you know, yes, you can find incredibly strong correlates that look really selective. But in order to know that, you have to do a whole bunch of different tasks and test under different conditions, not only task conditions, but um, sort of motivationally uh, different contexts. And I, if you uh, do things the same way, like a, a Nate, Powell was in my lab, in his old lab, looked at these neurons over many days. And as long as the animal's doing the same thing, the, the correlates will just be the same. You start changing things up, everything gets remapped. And so you have a general purpose neurons, and it's the pattern of activity. And the other thing is, you know, we've seen that the firing rate across the ensemble is very stable. Uh, it's just these patterns, like what neurons are active relative to their own baseline and which neurons are, are less active. That, that determines, that's the information, at least in anterior cingulate. And then on top of it, you have this sort of context morph that is like a separate signal that's there in the background, as we saw in those rasters all the time, that's encoding things like, where am I? Or how do I feel? Or you know, what is my sort of emotional state? And these things snap into place. As soon as that, they make a realization things are different. And it, we've seen this. We had a 2010 paper where we've seen these abrupt transitions when the animal realizes a new rule is in play, like an internal realization. We've seen it when they have a different sort of motivational state. And we've seen it when they switch physical context. So there's nothing. Uh, you know, sort of domain specific about it. It really is this sort of the moment the animal realizes or uh, or thinks something's different, you get this reorganization and it changes, as I said, the way that that events are are encoded. So you take these two things, put them together, and this is the sort of resultant activity state pattern. And so again, the total level of activity rate remains uh, constant, but the peaks and trough get dynamically rearranged, and that's the information that's kind of broadcast to the to the rest of the brain. OK, so um, I just want to thank so James Hyman, uh, Leah, and Barack. Uh, the, James is now at UNLV, and Leah is at, at Western University. Um, th they uh, and Barack, who is still in my lab, collected all the data that I talked about today. These are current um, lab members. These are my uh, two technicians in the lab, uh, collaborators, and then support by uh, mainly CIHR and, uh, and Tula Foundation to, to do this work. So thanks. Thanks for listening. Sorry that I went over.
<clears throat> that was amazing. I really congratulate you on um, hanging in there what must have been somewhat surprising data and, and <clears throat> you know, <laughs> not just stepping back and saying, I can't make anything of this. And it ties in, I think, with a lot of the talks we heard earlier in this two-day meeting, which I think is also really exciting. Um, so we have actually a little additional time for questions. So, um, okay, we've got one right there, and then we've got one next to us. Hi. Um, so one of the things that struck me about uh, the data that you showed was actually that it, it really constrains the mechanisms for this, this transformation, right? Because if I understood correctly, the, the context transformation is, is a linear transformation uh, between these two states. And not only that, it's, it's restricted to rotations in this space and translations. There's no scaling, right? Because the distances are the maintained distance, between yeah, the yeah. clusters. So that really constrains what kind of mechanisms could actually uh, cause this transformation, I think, right? You could uh, write this as, as an addition of two or multiplication of two sets of weights onto the synapses of these neurons. I don't think it's synaptic weight changes. I mean, it's instant. There's, I mean, it's just a different input that flows through. The, it's kind of like Tim Murphy presented, I think. I think of it that way, where there's these sort of intrinsic uh, freeways that are there, and they're just snapping into these different things. There's no way it's weight changes. It's just too instantaneous and flexible. Uh, it's just the way the information flows through the system. Um, in terms of a transformation, uh, so th um, it's true the distances are the same. Um, I, I don't really know if that if it, if it's linear in every domen dimension because it's um, you know a high dimensional space. So it could be one neuron moving nonlinearly in one direction and another in a, exactly the opposite. So and it ends up being some you know. Uh, um, it could be nonlinear, but it's all nonlinear for the same three way actions, right? I, I don't know the transformation um, geometry, and I don't, you know, it's a reduced space that we're looking at the triangular geometry. So, I, you know, I, I don't know what that transformation is. Um, I don't know if, if that answers or. I think we had another. Uh, thanks. That was an interesting talk. Um, the. The data that you've shown is all based on sort of a firing rate code. Have you also looked at synchrony or temporal patterns of firing, firing or for instance, whether they fire at a particular phase of um, different LFP cycles as, a, as an alternative way of encoding information? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, one thing about this code that's really amazing is, uh, so we had a paper a couple of years ago looking at this, that uh, the trials that neurons fail on are often uh, one neuron fails on are often not the trials that another neuron does. So, so it's, it's like this phenomena that I showed with the eating uh, where you have this sort of Tetris thing where the, they fit into each other. So in order to maintain the, the ensemble um, behavior as a fixed rate and it, you have a fixed rate of the ensemble and you have neurons that are incredibly unreliable, the only way that works is that you have this uh, lack of synchrony into, in terms of which trials a neuron is on relative to its, its, uh, the other neurons in the circuit. So these neurons, like uh, it's about 10% of the trials on average that, the, that a neuron is, is respond, you know, responding on. And um, it just happens that they're not the same trials. Whereas in the striatum that we encoded simultaneously, you have a lot more synchrony. The cross correlograms of these things are terrible. They're broad, and they're like it's uh, you know less than one percent. It's in, these things just don't correlate well. They do phase lock to the hippocampal theta, and um, those cells may have different properties. We're, we're kind of looking a bit in that, but um, yeah, you can look. They phase lock to different um, frequencies as well. Any other questions? You know, w one thing that makes me think about is the talk that was earlier today about studying humans in natural environments and then people saying, well, you know, there's a benefit and risk with all of these. And you almost think that you could do a very structured task now, but just change the, the room or something. And yeah. Also, so it's sort of a fascinating that it opens up the door to some other approaches. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, the, if it's this, this context effects is as strong as in other brain areas, but you know, seeing the talk yesterday about all this wa movement correlates in V1, and so, you know, I mean, it, it just it, uh, it it really amazes me. So maybe it isn't that different. Thanks. Well, thank you. <laughs>